So it, it, uh, thank you for the privilege of the podium. And I, um, you have just heard from three of our experts uh, on the unusual and unexpected um, findings and the ethical, the ethical and medical legal implications of these findings. And I will review some of the um, incidental and some of the strange and surprising findings that you may um, encounter. And, and I will focus on their recognition and management. Um, now, the management, you have to have full understanding that some of the literature is conflicting and sometimes very sparse on these very rare scenarios. Uh, I have nothing to disclose. Um, so, despite our advanced um, preoperative technology, we do still find surprising um, uh, surprising findings during surgery as you have seen so far. And our best advice, unfortunately or fortunately, comes uh, not from um, data but from experience and senior colleagues, sometimes in the middle of the night. Um, it's a little humor for the last talk there. Um, so what uh, so just to show you what do surgeons find unexpectedly in, in, the, in the operating room. And here we have a Tennessee study describing 2% of patients having unexpected findings in bariatric surgery, um, such as ectopic pancreas, um, AV malformations, mesenchymal tumors, and liver masses. Um, and this is in par with other literature. So pretty much it's, it's uh, rare that you would find something unexpected, but you have to be prepared. Um, and uh, this talk and um, these studies actually exclude some of the other more common things like unexpected hernias, um, liver cirrhosis or liver um, steatosis, some uh, aberrant anatomy malformations. Um, and a good percentage of patients um, from the surprising findings have GYN pathology, which I will not cover here, but suffice to say that uh, intraoperative GYN consultation is paramount when questionable uh, GYN pathology is found, and specifically in bariatric surgery, it is reasonable to evaluate uh, the ovaries in all females before bariatric surgery proceeds. Um, this is in, uh, in laparoscopic appendectomies. These are some of the un um, unexpected findings, inflamed uh, papillic appendices, inflammatory disorders of the intestines, GYN pathology as well, um, acute, and other sort of uh, pathologies such as acute cholecystitis or parasitic infections. Um, here I'd like to just point out that in less than 1% of these patients, the treatment was changed based on the intraoperative findings. So laparoscopy may, may be a good strategy um, after all. Um, so let's proceed with some case scenarios. Uh, I'm going to start with a general case that will serve as sort of a backdrop for unexpected um, findings that I will uh, show you. This is a 25-year-old morbidly obese woman with a 12-hour history of periumbilical uh, abdominal pain. She has classic signs and symptoms of acute appendicitis. She's being admitted to you. You're a locum physician at night somewhere in a, in a rural hospital. Uh, she has unremarkable um, findings on laboratory investigations and her I imaging is equivocal. And this is what you find. You find a normal appendix and an inflamed Meckel's diverticulum. And I'm not going to explain to you what Meckel's is, but I will just suffice to say that with an inflamed Meckel's diverticulum, there is um, plenty of evidence that you should pr proceed with uh, segmental resection of the small bowel. Now the question remains, uh, what do you do with this normal appendix in this 25-year-old woman? And as uh, Dr. Schweitzberg alluded, you have to know the data. And um, incidental appendectomy is still somewhat controversial, but um, more and more the literature points out that um, there, there is a role for incidental appendectomy in selected patients. And this is a... Um, a study by Newhall in surgical endoscopy that was just published that looks at a cost and risk of prophylactic appendectomy and the um, ongoing risk of developing ascitis, appendicitis um, later on in, the, in life. Uh, this is using a statistical model. And they've concluded that removal of a non-inflamed appendix during unrelated abdominal surgery can actually prevent the downstream effect, effects and costs of appendicitis uh, only in selected patients. Um, so, in males, 
uh, from 18 to 27 and females from 18 to 28. Outside of these parameters, um, the risks actually outweigh the benefits. So our patient would get an incidental appendectomy. Um, so what about an incidental uninflamed meckles? Um, so if you find this in your operating room, the uh, inflamed appendix that you remove, and an uninflamed uh, meckles. How many people here in the audience would uh, also resect the meckles diverticulum? Okay, so a few, and how many would leave it alone? More, okay. So um, what does the data tell us? Um, well, it is actually divided. Um, this is according to a large retrospective review by Parks and colleagues. They looked at um, 1,476 patients. Um, they found that um, incidentally detected Meckel's diverticulum should be removed if meeting one of these um, high-risk criteria. The patient has to be younger than 50 years old. Um, a male patient, the diverticulum is longer than two centimeters. There is um, a palpable or uh, suggestion of ectopic or abnormal features within the diverticulum itself. And in those cases, the, um, it is justified to remove the Meckel's diverticulum. So in our patient, according to this study, um, she would potentially get a Meckel's uh, diverticulectomy. Now, there is there are studies uh, with opposing evidence, for example, in this study by Zani and colleagues from um, systematic, systematic review of the evidence, um, they found that resection of the incidentally detected meckles had a significantly higher uh, early complication rate and that leaving it in situ had zero complication rates in studies that were reviewed, even long-term studies, as you can see on the right. Also, they found that um, in order to save one patient from death, 758 resections would have to be done. So this is interesting. The jury is still out, and our patient may be considered for resection, but if you left it alone, you um, may be um, medical legally covered as well. Now, um, just to get you thinking about other pathologies, weird and wonderful pathologies, this is another potential finding in our patient. So she has a normal Meckel, she has a normal appendix, but this is what she has. Um, so what is your differential diagnosis? Um, and I wish I had uh, one of those click things where you could choose, but um, this is definitely a, a good differential. Um, is this an intestinal hematoma, endometriosis, uh, epiploic appendagitis, ectopic pancreas, or a GIST tumor. So all of these are possible. Um, in fact, in our patient, it turned out um, to be a um, epiploic appendagitis. It just, from the anatomy, it originated in the sigmoid colon and the uh, fatty mesentery, and um, it consisted mostly of fatty tissue. So it was removed, and it, um, it um, turned out to be um, epiploic appendagitis. Um, and most common sites are in the colon mesentery, and when it's recognized, it can be safely resected. What about this? This is also a potential finding in our 25-year-old woman. Um, it is a uh, yellowish-gray, rubbery, two-centimeter mass with a clear border, accidentally found near the pylorus on the anti-mesenteric side of the duodenum. Um, any ideas? All right, so what is the diagnosis? So these are, this is your good differential, and I want you to think about these pathologies because it's, um, sometimes it's not what you think. But um, in this case, this tissue was biopsied, and it turned out to be a pancreatic um, heterotopia. So um, it is often impossible to diagnose heterotopic pancreas from mucinous carcinoma, and our oncologist can correct me if I'm wrong, but it can become a quite uh, a nightmare between the pathologist and the surgeon uh, as to the diagnosis if you need to, uh, to make the diagnosis intraoperatively. And most of the time, um, the decision making in terms of surgical management is made um, down the road. It's not done, the, the, surgery, the surgical resection is not done right there and then. It needs to be biopsied. Um, 
the uh, heterotropic pancreatic tissue is, uh, it occurs as an error in embryological development, it found, found rarely at laparotomy, mostly in men aged 60 to 80. Um, in children, it can be found in the meckles, and um, over 50% are found in the stomach or the second portion of the duodenum. Uh, lesions can be symptomatic, and then they can actually present with pancreatitis, pseudocyst, insulinoma, adenoma, malignancy, uh, all of the things that pancreas gets, the heterotopic pancreatic tissue can also get. Okay, so um, the treatment is a little controversial. Lesions uh, that are less than two centimeters, it's advocated that they are just followed. However, it, the gray area between the two and the three centimeter size lesions is, um, is very difficult, and this requires um, sort of a consultation with the pathologist not um, and, and your experienced colleagues. This is not something that I would tackle in the middle of the night. Okay. Uh, greater than three centimeters are resected. So this is, let's move on to another scenario because I have little time left and we're already at it, um, running late. Um, so this is a 53-year-old um, African-American male that presented with abdominal pain and bloating, and he had an 11-kilogram weight loss and um, had um, a recent history of uh, pneumonia, was treated with uh, antibiotics, resolved, and he presented with abdominal distension and on physical exam was found to have ascites. Um, he's a non-smoker. He's a construction worker in um, Southern California. and. Um, he, his ascites was um, tapped and uh, cultured and analyzed, and it was negative for any mycobacterium tuberculosis. And um, his EGD was normal. His CT abdomen just showed some um, uh, thickened peritoneum. So this is your differential diagnosis, and these are all good diagnoses for this patient, including carcinomatosis. And I would strongly encourage you to biopsy this intraoperatively um, before making a decision about treatment. Now, in this case, um, it did turn out to be tuberculous peritonitis. Um, often in this uh, disease, you can find uh, this multiple uh, white uh, tubercles on the visceral parietal surfaces, uh, string-like fibrous strands, a mental thickening and masses. Um, and the diagnosis is often uh, difficult, uh, but mostly obtained from the peritoneal biopsy. Um, acidic fluid can have um, a lot of um, lymphocytes, but it's often negative for acid fasting. The, uh, the patients often test negative on their PPD. Uh, the PCR has um, a good sensitivity, but uh, poor, uh, I think it should be the other round, but a good, uh, poor sensitivity, good specificity, and the ADA um, is also um, has its difficulties in diagnosis. So really the peritoneal biopsy is the main uh, diagnostic um, tool. And it has a very good prognosis if promptly recognized and effectively treated medically. Uh, of course, keep in mind the risk factors such as exposure and immunosuppression. Now, another great imitator, which was on your differential, was uh, disseminated coccygeomycosis, and it occurs in immunocompromised uh, patients. It is a um, soil-dwelling fungus that exists in, um, actually there's uh, an increased um, uh, prevalent incidence of infections in the southwestern United States because um, of a lot of construction being there for some reason. This is what's in the literature, but uh, inhalation of these airborne spores can cause infection, and peritoneal coccidomycosis is uh, an unusual extrapulmonary uh, finding that, that um, you should keep on your differential. Um, it has been actually reported, incidentally discovered during even a hernia operation uh, when uh, thick granulomatous fluid was uh, found in the hernia sac, so um, it's diagnosed based on identification of the co uh, coccygeal uh, spherules on the cytology and histology. All right, I'm gonna keep going here. <laughs> I have a few more cases. Um, I'll just quickly go through some of the pictures at least so you can recognize this. This is a differential diagnosis for this. Um, and these are all good diagnoses. This is a diverticulosis of the small bowel. You leave this alone. You don't need to resect it unless the patient is 
um, symptomatic, and I'm not going to go through it in detail, but there's some more pictures of what it looks like. Okay. However, um, don't confuse it with this diagnosis, which is a transilluminating uh, mass in the mesentery of the bowel. And um, again, good uh, differential diagnosis. This actually is a lymph angioma, okay, which is, um, which is, um, uh, it, it can be um, congenital or acquired, and it, the, the um, treatment for this is resection because they, they will grow and they will recur, and it, treatment with sclerosing agents do not, doesn't work for these masses. Here it is being transilluminated, but it doesn't always transilluminate, especially in adults. It can be a solid mass in the mesentery, and um, keep lymphangioma on your differential. This is another case scenario, small bowel tumor. I just want to point out the, um, the differential for um, a, a mesenchymal uh, tumors, and this turns out to be a gist. Uh, however, not all mesenchymal tumors are malignant. Um, just um, uh, incidentally, the gist tumors are more prevalent in morbidly obese patients and are found in bariatric surgery commonly. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the, um, all the uh, uh, treatment options, however, just keep in mind that um, these masses, if they're small, they can be left in situ, and if they're larger than two centimeters, need to be resected with negative margins. So um, more fun things. Key points, unexpected intraoperative findings are commonly encountered, and the surgeon must consider uh, the possible and often rare differential diagnoses. Um, modern cross-sectional imaging techniques often help to identify intra-abdominal findings uh, and must be carefully reviewed uh, to help with an anticipating these challenges. Um, in fact, there's very little peer evidence, uh, peer-reviewed evidence on how to deal with these um, when encountered, uh, but there is some evidence that you need to be familiar with and, of course, always consider the ethical and medical legal issues uh, when dealing with these unusual findings. Thank you very much for your attention, and we'll do questions now. Thank you.